Hey there folks, Zach here. In this video, we're gonna check out an example involving constrained optimization. Specifically, we'd like to find the maximum and minimum values of this function, f of x, y equals 4x squared plus y squared. However, we're only allowed to consider inputs from the set r. Here r consists of all points x, y satisfying the constraints x squared plus 3y squared is less than or equal to 16, and y is greater than or equal to minus 2. Now at this point, I encourage you to pause the video and try this problem for yourself. We'll take up the solutions in a moment. Okay, now where does one begin with a problem like this? We're asked to optimize a function over some wacky set of points. I personally find it really helpful to start with a sketch of this domain r, so I can see what points are actually being considered here. In this case, our inputs have to satisfy two inequalities. The second inequality is simple enough. y is greater than or equal to minus 2. But which point satisfy the first inequality exactly? Well, if this were an equality, we'd be talking about the points where x squared plus 3y squared equals 16. This is the equation of an ellipse, right? If we divide both sides by 16 and do a little factoring, we can write this equation as x over 4 squared plus y over 4 over root 3 squared equals 1. And this is the standard form for the equation of an ellipse. We can see from this equation that the ellipse is centered at the origin, it has a semi-major axis of length 4 in the x direction, and it has a semi-minor axis of length 4 over root 3 in the y direction. It's going to look something like this. But of course, we're not dealing with inequality. We're dealing with an inequality x squared plus 3y squared is less than or equal to 16. The less than or equal to here is telling us to consider not just the points along the boundary of the ellipse, but also the points inside. In addition, we should only be considering the points in this region above the line y equals minus 2, which would be this portion here. So this is our region r. As you'll see later, it'll be helpful to identify these two points of intersection. So maybe I'll leave it as an exercise to you to show that the line and the ellipse intersect at the points minus 2, minus 2, and 2, minus 2. All right, let's move on to our optimization. Okay, we've determined our region R. So what's next? Well, we need to find our maxes and mins. Notice that here we're optimizing a nice continuous function, f of x, y equals 4x squared plus y squared, over a closed and bounded set R. We therefore know from our extreme value theorem that this function really will attain global maximum and minimum values somewhere throughout the region, and our algorithm for extreme values tells us how to find them. It says that we have to look at critical points of f that are contained in the region, and we need to look for potential maxima and minima of f along the boundary of r. For this latter step, as you'll soon see, we have a couple of different methods at our disposal. At the end, we're going to have to compare the values of our function at all of the critical points and all of the points of interest we find along the boundary. The largest value will be our global max, and the smallest will be our global min. Alrighty, so we've got lots to do. Let's start by locating any critical points inside the region R. The critical points come from our partial derivatives, and the partial derivatives of f are given by fx equals 8x and fy equals 2y. These are nice polynomial functions, and so they exist everywhere. Therefore, the only way that we can obtain a critical point is if both partial derivatives are zero. And it's not too hard to see that this will only occur at the origin. Since the origin, x, y equals 0, 0, is indeed inside the region r, this is a point that we have to consider. Okay, let's move on to optimizing along the boundary of r. When it comes to optimizing along the boundary, notice that here we really have two distinct boundary components, one coming from the line y equals minus 2, and the other coming from the ellipse x squared plus 3y squared equals 16. We'll examine our function over these two components separately, and I think I'm going to start with the simpler component, the line segment. We could use the method of Lagrange multipliers to help us, but I don't think we need anything quite so involved here. Instead, let's think. How big or how small can our function possibly get when we restrict y to be equal to minus 2? Well, according to our equation, the function along this line segment is given by f of x minus 2 equals 4x squared plus minus 2 squared, which is 4x squared plus 4. 
Of course, we aren't really concerned with all x values here. We need to make sure that we're only focusing on points on the line segment. Since the line segment is defined only for x values between minus 2 and 2, this is the domain we're going to consider. This, folks, is the description of our function along this line segment. Okay, we've reduced this portion of the problem to maximizing and minimizing a single variable function over a closed interval a, b, something you learned how to do back in Calc 1. Now we could try taking the derivative of this expression and setting it equal to 0 to locate any critical points, but in this case I think it should be clear that the only critical point is going to occur when x is 0. After all, this equation describes a parabola, a parabola with a vertex at x equals 0. Since the only critical point of a parabola occurs at its vertex, x equals 0 is going to give us our only critical point. Our critical point is xy equals 0 minus 2. Now are we done with this line segment? No! Remember, we also have to consider the endpoints of our closed interval. These endpoints occur when x is minus 2 or x is 2. And of course, y is equal to minus 2 over the entire line segment. So we've therefore obtained three candidates for the location of our functions max and min along the line segment. The points 0 minus 2, minus 2 minus 2, and 2 minus 2. We'll put these points aside for the meantime as we examine our function along the other boundary component, the ellipse. To optimize over our elliptical boundary, we could try using the same technique as we did with the line segment on the last slide. But for the sake of variety, I'm going to show you how we can do this using our method of Lagrange multipliers. In order to apply the Lagrange multiplier algorithm from the last video, we'll need to first identify our functions f and g. f is the function we're maximizing or minimizing. f of xy is 4x squared plus y squared. Whereas g is the function giving our constraint. g of xy is equal to a constant k. So in this case, g of xy is x squared plus 3y squared, and k is 16. Now according to our algorithm, we need to solve the system of equations gradient of f equals lambda times gradient of g. And of course, our points need to lie on the constraint curve, so g of xy must also be equal to k. Since the gradient of f is the vector 8x, 2y, and the gradient of g is 2x, 6y, we get the following three equations. 8x equals 2 lambda x, 2y equals 6 lambda y, and x squared plus 3y squared equals 16. Maybe we'll call these equations 1, 2, and 3. Now sometimes solving these nonlinear systems can be pretty tough. I recommend starting with the simplest equation and carefully trying to express one variable in that equation in terms of another. Then try substituting that expression into one of the other equations and slowly begin to hone in on your solutions. It's important that you take your time here. It can be very easy to miss solutions if you're not careful. From our system, both the first and second equations look pretty reasonable. So let's go ahead and start with equation 1. Your first thought might be to divide both sides of this equation by x. But what if x is 0? See, it's easy to skip over little details like this if you're rushing. Instead of dividing, I'm going to move everything to the left side and factor. We get 2x times 4 minus lambda equals 0. And therefore, either x is 0 or lambda equals 4. We'll consider these two cases separately. First, if x is 0, can we find the corresponding values for y? Let's try using equation 3, which gives us a relationship between x and y. We get that 0 squared plus 3y squared equals 16, and hence y is plus or minus the square root of 16 over 3, which is plus or minus 4 over root 3. So the points 0 plus or minus 4 over root 3 are potential candidates for our max and min. However, since 0 minus 4 over root 3 isn't actually a point on this boundary component, we can discard it. If instead lambda is equal to 4, perhaps we can get some information using equation 2, the only other equation involving lambda. We find that 2y equals 6 times 4y, so 2y is 24y. From here it's not too hard to see that y must be 0. Again, we can turn to equation 3 to get the corresponding value for, in this case, x. We find that x squared plus 3 times 0 squared is 16, and hence x is plus or minus 4. 
This means that plus or minus 4, 0 are also candidates for our extrema along the ellipse. Note that both of these points are indeed on our boundary curve and so must be considered. You may recall from the algorithm for Lagrange multipliers that there are actually a couple of other ways in which we can obtain candidates for global maxes and mins. In addition to considering solutions of that system of equations from the last slide, we also have to check if there are points on the constraint curve where the gradient of g is equal to zero. These points must also be considered, but in this example that's simply not going to be possible. After all, the gradient of g is the vector 2x, 6y, and the only way for this vector to be zero is if both x and y are zero. Since this point, the origin, isn't on our constraint curve, we don't need to consider it, although we are considering it separately as a critical point of f. It's on our radar for a different reason. We also have to make sure to include the endpoints of our boundary curve. These points, minus 2, minus 2, and 2, minus 2, caught our attention already when we examined the other boundary component, the line segment, so we don't actually get anything new here. Okay, so to summarize, we've identified six points along the boundary as candidates for our global max and min, as well as the single critical point of f located at the origin. By plugging each of these points into the function f and comparing the outputs, we see that f is largest on r at the points plus or minus 4, 0, giving us a global max of 64, and f is smallest on r at the point 0, 0, giving us a global min of 0. Looking at the graph of f over the region r, we can see many of the familiar features that popped up in our analysis. Notably, our function has a critical point at the origin where it reaches a global min. Along the line segment where y equals minus 2, we're expecting to see that parabolic curve, z equals 4x squared plus 4, right? Sure enough, there's our parabola. It gives us one critical point and two endpoints. Along the ellipse, we find three more critical points, two of which, plus or minus 4, 0, are where our global maxima can be found. I'd like to end this video with a quick look at the geometry of our Lagrange multiplier method. Remember, in our recap video, I mentioned that the global max and min of a function f, subject to a constraint g of x, y equals k, will occur at points where the level curves of f are just tangent to the constraint curve. Is that the case in this example? It sure is. Note that the level curves of f are obtained by setting z equal to a constant k. For all positive real numbers k, we can rearrange this equation to get something like this, which hopefully we recognize as the equation of an ellipse centered at the origin. This ellipse is going to be longer in the y direction this time, right? It's going to be long and skinny. As we increase the value of k, the ellipse becomes larger. It increases in size, eventually becoming just tangent to our constraint curve at these two points along the y-axis. 0 plus or minus 4 over root 3. And what do you know? These are two points that we found during our search. As we continue to increase the value of k, we see that the ellipse eventually becomes tangent to the constraint curve at two other points, the points on the x-axis, plus or minus 4, 0. Sure enough, these are the other two points located during our analysis. Pretty cool, isn't it?